I honestly thought nobody would show up. I thought, who's going to come to an electronic version of Alpha? But I remember breaking out to my small group and hearing the pop, pop, pop of the screens coming on. And I thought, oh, they're all here. And I had to like hold back tears like I was a little girl at a party waiting for guests to arrive. Will anybody come? And they all showed up. Oh my goodness, we're looking at people on a screen and we are going to evangelize to them on a screen. Hi everyone, I'm Nadia Zverznik and I am the Executive Ministries Director at Forest City Community Church in London, Ontario, and I have the blessing of running Alpha for our church. When we heard about the pandemic, of course, one of the things that we needed to pivot quite quickly was to do Alpha online. So on week three during this online Alpha, I was very shocked because, you know, normally week three, uh, when Nikki prays that prayer at the end of the video, there's usually some crickets, some skeptics, there's still a lot of questioning. But in this, in this experience, I actually had three guests ask for the prayer. They wanted me to, to actually put it in the chat bar so that they could read it again. And I thought, okay, it's going to end there. But I actually had one guest say to me very quickly, I, I would really like to pray that prayer. Can I pray that prayer? And I tried my best to not like, tremor <laughs> or show that I was shaking because I was shocked. I was overwhelmingly excited. And then two others said, I, I, I would like to pray that prayer. And I, again, I was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> Nadia, calm down, you know? Uh, and they did. And it was an incredible experience. It was overwhelming for everyone involved. Uh, we spent the rest of the time together really just unpacking and celebrating with them. But I have to say, in a sense, when I look back, the vulnerability that happened between week one to week three in this Zoom call atmosphere um, really allowed for us to get to that point really quickly. And so uh, the online experience proved to me that, you know, it's a much easier environment for people to share in. We got through the next five weeks of Alpha Online, um, and we decided very quickly, I think it was three weeks into the online experience, we're launching another one. And so without a lot of notice, I literally, one week of advertising, Facebook ads, a couple Facebook ads, a couple social media posts on Instagram, and then one Sunday of advertising. And we thought, well, if we get 20 people, we'll do it. And we got 160 in one week. And we were shocked. We were completely shocked. And then we thought, well, this one went so well, we can't stop now. We have to do another one. So we rolled out another one. Uh, four weeks after that, we rolled out our third alpha in a matter of two months. I think this is my 11th alpha that I've run. I've had lots of wonderful experiences, but I've never had an entire group um, reconfirm or commit for the first time to faith. And in this online alpha, I was blessed with a group of nine people, all at varying degrees of skepticism, agnostics. Uh, varying degrees of walks of life and some never knowing who God was, some who had been introduced as a child and uh, never really as an adult. And I was overwhelmed to see that all nine um, committed to faith through the weekend and various times throughout Alpha. They all prayed the prayer. They all had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. That has never, ever happened to me before. Never. So. Um, nine people <laughs> that I probably would have never met if I didn't do online alpha. I want to be clear because I think the online experience provided a place for them to do this that was quick and easy and efficient, but not only that, very powerful. And so um, they never dropped off. I never lost any of them. Uh, they all stayed on. I've had all nine every week and every single one of them now has a new relationship with Jesus Christ.
I'm Michael Moll, I'm a medical doctor by training, I happen to be a TV presenter as well and a producer of television shows. I had grown up in a, in a Christian home. I realized I'm, I'm living someone else's life or someone else's spiritual life. It's, it's no longer authentic, it's no longer real, it's just living what my parents have kind of passed down to me. And um, I remember sitting in my room, I, it was on my 17th birthday, and read a verse, it's, it's an arbitrary verse, it was a Deuteronomy. Uh, I, I, a verse that I said before you, life and death, blessings and cursings, now choose life. And I just prayed there and then, I said, Father, I choose life, I choose you. In fact, take my life, it's yours, do with it what you want. The finding moment that changed my outlook in life was as a, as a in fact, I was a houseman um, involved in a, an operation. We were doing an ectopic pregnancy. It's a pregnancy that happens in the tubes. So you need to terminate that pregnancy, otherwise it's going to rupture and the mother's life is threatened. And I'll never forget this. Mom was about eight weeks pregnant. We, we go into her abdomen and there's this beautiful little um, ectopic pregnancy and we burst the amnion sac. And this eight week old little fetus, hands, fingers, literally just for a moment, crosses its arms, crosses its legs and just kind of passes on. This is life. God's fingerprints on this little child. And, and there and then I remember thinking to myself, I want to fight for life I, I, in, in everything. And not just life, but, the, but, but life to the fullest. You know, I, I think there are many, many people that are alive that just aren't really living. I think like a lot of us, um, have a, a very deep desire to, to count for something, to matter, to, to make a difference. Um, I, I just cannot face the idea that life is get born, get educated, get a job, retire, die. You know, it, there must be more to life than that.
Good morning and welcome to Oshawa Temple's online service for January 10th. Happy New Year to you and your families. I trust that God continues to speak to you in these days. Majors David and April McNeely are on vacation this week and so we want to be keeping them in our thoughts and our prayers. We're so pleased that Colonel Lindsay Rowe is our special guest for the service this morning. Many of you will know that Lindsay and his wife Lynette served as Corps officers here at Oshawa Temple for a number of years. They're retired officers now, living in Newfoundland, where they are both very active in their Corps and are called upon to conduct retreats and special events throughout the year, of course, prior to COVID. The focus of our service this morning is mission. I believe that this is a good time of year to reflect on what is our mission as a body of believers. What does mission look like right now during this time of COVID? And how do we pursue it? How do we reflect God in our world today when we ourselves might be groaning under the strain? Be blessed as you worship our God of our tomorrows and may he bless you. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this new year, for this year of possibilities and potential. We thank you that we know that you go ahead of us, that you are in us, that we have your power residing in us so that we can deal with whatever comes our way. And Lord, as we think about mission today, and as we hear from your servant, I pray that our minds and our hearts would be open to what you would have us hear this morning. I pray this in your precious name. Amen.
We share things every day, things that are meaningful to us, that entertain, inspire, or challenge us. We share moments, good or bad, big or small, because what we share matters. We have the chance to share something incredible, the hope that has transformed our lives. And today, more than ever, people are searching for hope, for connection, for meaning. The life we've experienced in Jesus is available to our friends and neighbors. And it's easier to share than we might think. Over the next few weeks, we are running Alpha, an opportunity to share Jesus with friends, family, and colleagues online. Each week, we'll connect with each other, watch a short video, and have time to discuss our thoughts and questions without needing to have all the answers. All it takes is a simple invitation. Share life, faith, hope, Jesus. Who will you invite? Well, it's so nice to have Lindsay sharing with us again. Now, the Bible reading for today is uh, Psalm 85. Lord, you poured out blessings on your land. You've restored the fortunes of Israel. You forgave the guilt of your people. Yes, you covered all their sins. You held back your fury. You kept back your blazing anger. Now restore us again, O God of our salvation. Put aside your anger against us once more. Will you be angry with us always? Will you prolong your wrath to all generations? Won't you revive us again so your people can rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. I listen carefully to what God the Lord is saying, for he speaks peace to his faithful people. But let them not return to their foolish ways. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him so our land will be filled with his glory. Unfailing love and truth have met together, righteousness and peace have kissed. Truth springs up from the earth, and righteousness smiles down from heaven. Yes, the Lord pours down his blessings. Our land will yield its bountiful harvest. Righteousness goes as a herald before him, preparing the way for his steps. May the Lord bless the reading for today. Good morning, Church. I'm grateful to Majors McNeely for this opportunity to once again share with Oshawa Temple their congregation and their extended family through the online ministry. When I asked David if there was a particular theme on which he would like me to focus today, he suggested that mission might be appropriate. And I'm happy to do that because as a core officer for many years, that would be my focus too during the month of January. It's an excellent time to focus our attention on what our mission is and how exactly we can carry out that mission, both as a congregation and as individual Christians. I want to begin by affirming the excellent work being done by Commissioners Floyd and Tracy Tidd and the leadership team at THQ to update and clarify the mission of the Canada and Bermuda Territory. The mission of the church and its membership is stated very clearly in broad terms in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, verse 19. Go and make disciples of all nations, and don't forget that I'm with you and will be with you to the very end. But did you know that the book of Revelation gives a beautiful picture of what the church will ultimately look like when it has faithfully fulfilled that mission? Listen to the opening verses of chapter 7. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. <clears throat> they were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. They cried out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. 
All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. That's what the church will ultimately look like when it has fulfilled its mission here on earth. Did you notice that there is not even the slightest hint of racism or prejudice? The ground around the throne of God is completely level. There are no raised platforms for the religious or political hierarchy. There is no segregation whatsoever. We all stand on common ground to worship the creator, redeemer, and sustainer of all life. That gathered community you will notice in verse 9 is transnational, transtribal, transracial, and translinguistic. It's a bit more of a challenge these days, of course, with COVID-19 restrictions of mask wearing and social distancing. But the mission of the church, as it carries out the Great Commission today, is to live out now, empowered by the Holy Spirit, what we will be when we are finally gathered around the throne. One of the greatest challenges facing the church today, of course, as it goes into 2021, is that of clarifying and pursuing its mission in the face of pandemic. Some churches have done it better than others. As a retired Salvation Army officer who spent many years in executive leadership, I have to say that I'm proud of the many ways in which the Army has redefined itself, especially its approach to worship and service under very difficult circumstances. It's been a bit embarrassing to watch as some churches have chosen to protest and demand their right to gather, placing their membership at risk, rather than finding new and creative ways to reach their own people, and perhaps the many others who would have little interest in going to church physically, but who just might tune in online or appreciate a little help or encouragement. When the church becomes fixated on its own property and the way we've always done it, mission is often jettisoned in favor of protecting the status quo. How then does the church, you and I, react to such a scenario? What does mission look like in this context and how exactly are we to pursue it? Let me first of all say that it's every preacher's responsibility to interpret the times and to speak the word of God into those times. That's what the prophets did. That's what Jesus did. That's what the apostles did. And that's what we as preachers, even retired preachers, are required to do. But what exactly might the word of God have to say about this matter? We've heard many sermons about faith, hope, love, comfort, and so on, and that's entirely relevant. But is there a biblical model or example that might also speak into the mission of the church in a time of pandemic? I'm grateful to Walter Brueggemann and N.T. Wright, among a few others, who have given careful attention to this matter. It's interesting that both Brueggemann and Wright call our attention to Israel in captivity as a model of mission for the church in a pandemic situation. Listen to what Brueggemann says in Virus as a Summons to Faith. We are called to learn how to peacefully relinquish the old world and to imaginatively give birth to a new world in which all life can flourish. Isn't that interesting? It's a call to not simply lament that things are not the way they used to be, but to partner with God in giving birth to a new reality, a new depth to our relationship with him, with one another, and with the world around us. 
Now, I've spent a great deal of time with the biblical writings surrounding the Babylonian captivity, especially Jeremiah, Lamentations, Daniel, and the Psalms, like Psalm 85, which was read just a little earlier, which was also written in the context of exile. And I've come to appreciate their value to a people who had lost the world they had known and loved and were looking for a new way forward. If you look at our experience of the pandemic as a form of exile, it makes reading about Israel's experience of exile amazingly relevant. Now, a word of caution. Israel was in captivity because it had done what God had told them not to do in Deuteronomy. And God had told, done what he told them he would have no choice but to do. You have to be careful how you apply that model to our current reality. When I was chief secretary in the Caribbean territory, the territorial commander sent my wife and I to Haiti to do some teaching and pastoring. He wanted us to encourage our people and to equip our officers in the face of some rather careless comments that had been made, especially by an American televangelist, in the wake of the earthquake that had claimed over 300,000 lives in Haiti. He declared that God was judging the people because of their sins. Now, we've all sinned. We all deserve judgment. But God comes to us with grace. And he offers forgiveness and mercy. The earthquake wasn't about judgment. And neither is the pandemic. But there are many things we can learn from Israel's experience as they too saw their whole world turned upside down. When you read those narratives surrounding the Babylonian captivity, you see that God's dealings with Israel are dripping with grace, mercy, and calls to deepen their relationship with him. But not only that, he also offers very practical advice on how to respond to the calamity that had befallen them. For one thing, he tells them to very quickly get over their self-pity and self-absorption. Now, lament is important, and it has a significant role to play in grief and loss. You have only to read the Psalms and the Book of Lamentations to see that God in no way discourages expressions of lament and sorrow. But as Lamentations also says, there is a time for weeping. The Babylonians had obviously heard about how the Israelites do worship. And so they ask him, won't you sing for us the way you used to sing back home? But they retorted, how can we sing the songs of Zion in a strange land? And they hung their harps on the willow trees and refused to sing. Unfortunately, that's where some Christians find themselves today by the waters of Babylon, confused, frustrated, angry, grieving the loss of normality in church worship and activity. Don't tell me we're looking at another year of having to sign up for church, to wear a mask, not being able to meet in small groups. How am I supposed to put up with this? Our self-pity closes our eyes to the plight of the people around us and the many ministry opportunities that they represent. God had chosen Israel to be a light to the nations. And now in captivity in one of those nations, they couldn't bring themselves to praise him by singing the songs of Zion. God's call to them was to first of all renew their covenant relationship with him which was simply not dependent upon the temple back in Jerusalem with all of its rituals and sacrifices and traditions. And that, I think, is God's call to us as we enter into this second year of pandemic as well, even in the face of a vaccine before us. We need to deepen our relationship with God so that although it is enhanced by our corporate worship, 
It is not totally dependent upon it. The second call that God gave to the Babylonians, or Israel rather, in Babylonian captivity, was for them to seek the good of the nation that had taken them into exile. He even encouraged them to make themselves at home, and take on leadership roles, and do whatever they could to improve the nation and make it successful. Sounds radical, doesn't it? But if you're not entirely self-absorbed, and filled with self-pity, perhaps you can see the needs of the people around you and redefine your relationship with them. Take a few moments when you can to reread the stories of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These are all in the context of exile, and yet see how they express their faith, how they defend their faith, how they refuse to compromise their faith and their values. And yet in the face of all of the difficulties that he had to face in exile, it is widely believed that the wise men came to Bethlehem looking for the Messiah because of the influence of Daniel in Babylonian captivity, experiencing the loss of everything the way they used to be. If we as individual Christians are not merely focused on our own discomfort, we might be able to enter the pain and loneliness of others and give them the much needed support they need. Maybe we can even make the world a better place. Perhaps there's a way that we can be the church in a new and creative way, a way that shows people just how much God loves them. You see, by showing them how much we care, we can make Jesus flesh and blood among them. We must remember that as much as we love them, God does not need our buildings and programs for his mission in the world to continue to move forward. Now let's try to unpack that a little more. Just how is the church supposed to be the church in the world if it can't go to church like it used to? Listen to what N.T. Wright suggests in God and the Pandemic. When the world is going through great convulsions, the followers of Jesus are called to be people of prayer at the place where the world is in pain. Paul talks about the pain of the world in Romans 8 and 22, doesn't he? We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. The groaning of the world is heard every day and night as you tune in to the national news. The whole world has been affected by this pandemic, and the whole world is groaning under its impact. But the pain is not only global, it's also personal. Paul talks about that too, doesn't he? Look at verse 23. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly, as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. As Christians, we have Jesus in our boat, and we know where we are headed even as we sail through these seas of adversity and pain called pandemic. We're not excluded from the pain and suffering of this world, but keep on reading. Look at verse 26. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings that words cannot express. Now, there's a powerful model for the church in those verses that we should be careful not to miss. What God is going to do in our communities in the face of this pandemic, he's going to do through us, his church, with boots on the ground. 
So we had better figure out how best to represent him, how best to minister to those who are at greatest risk. How exactly does God want to work through us? The world is groaning. We get that. We see it everywhere these days. We as individuals, even as Christians, are groaning. We get that too. We feel the pain of lost loved ones, separation from loved ones, loss of ritual and routine. But did you notice that the Spirit of God is also groaning? What do you think that might look like? How exactly is the world to know that the Spirit of God is groaning with them in the wake of this pandemic? It's only going to know if it hears the groaning of the church. And it can only hear the groaning of the church if the church is actually in the world, engaged with the world, in pain with the world, not campaigning for the right to retreat behind the walls of its sanctuaries. But let's press this even further. How exactly is the church to engage with the world? I think the Salvation Army has become an excellent model for how the church can respond to meeting the physical needs of men, women, and children in the midst of pandemic. And once again, I'm proud to call myself a Salvationist and an officer. And it's heartwarming to hear the affirmation come from the community and from our political leaders. I think the community understands that what we do is motivated by the love of God. But I also feel that every Salvationist has a responsibility to make sure that we are actually actively involved in our communities. And I think Romans 8 gives us the best clue as to how to do that. The very best thing we can do in times like these is to be people of prayer. I know we feel a little like Paul. We don't know what, what to pray for. We don't know how to pray in times like these. And so Paul tells us to engage in a very strange kind of prayer, wordless prayer. But wordless prayer right at the point where the world is hurting most. I see it as a call to be present, to be visible, not with pat answers or proclamation of judgment, but being present in very practical ways if we can, but still being present even with empty hands. In this way, I think we can show our communities that God is also present, also weeping, also groaning, but also available. I still love jogging, but these days my jogging is more like a prayer a thon, especially when I'm running through the community. As I jog past a house where I know there is pain, where there is suffering, where there has been recent loss of loved ones, and so there is grief, I engage in wordless prayer directed right at those homes. Perhaps you can join me. Perhaps you too can start walking through your community, casting prayers at those very places where you know there's pain and suffering and anxiety. God's message to Israel in Babylonian captivity, which remember represented the loss of everything normal for them, was to first of all repent of their sin deepen their relationship with him, and to work for the good of the community that had exiled them, rather than sinking into despair and discouragement and grieving the loss of past normality. In a similar way, after his resurrection, when Jesus found the disciples locked up behind closed doors in fear and trembling, his charge to them was to go out into the world, to be present rather than absent, and to be the physical manifestation of his presence in a hurting world. In many places, we're still in lockdown. There are still tears. But listen, friends, just as Jesus came to his disciples in their tears and lockdown 
and doubts too, as Thomas illustrates, he also comes to us. But he comes to us not just with comfort, but with a commission, with a challenge. Go and bring healing to the world. Go and bring comfort to the hurting. Go and be my presence in your community. Go and bring hope. General John Gowans once wrote, A Salvation Army Corps is a mission field, and a Corps officer is a mission team leader. I trust, dear friends, that this will be true of every ministry unit and every Salvationist in 2021, beginning with you and me. Let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, there's a sense in which we don't know how to pray in circumstances such as these. The glib and easy prayers we've prayed in the past just don't seem to capture the depth of our frustration, our suffering, and our pain. But you have invited us to keep on asking, seeking, knocking, assuring us that you will answer, you will be found, you will open the many doors that seem to have slammed shut in our faces, doors of health, safety, comfort, and normality. We don't know what to ask for exactly, Lord, but like Joseph to Josephat, our eyes are on you, because when we have reached the end of our rope, there's simply no one else we'd rather be hanging on to. You have promised never to leave us, you said you will never forsake us. Be to us all that you have promised you would be. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you, my friends.
Hi everyone. We have Alpha coming up January 31st from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock on Sunday nights. It's going to be a wonderful time. People are going to have a great time getting to know each other online as well as watching these great videos. Uh, they start out with a 20 minute video we watch together uh, online and it's shot all over the world. Very fascinating. The topics are exceptional. It's wonderful to see people uh, explore a closer relationship to Jesus and, and who Jesus was and is and uh, what Christianity is all about. So uh, what can you do? What can you do to uh, help the Alpha program? Uh, you can pray for it, okay? That would be a wonderful thing because uh, prayer does matter as well as you can think of someone uh, possibly to invite. Now at the bottom of the screen here, uh, you can send them that link now that link will take them to our page uh, on our website and uh, it has on there a three minute uh, little commercial about Alpha as well as uh, you can even watch the first um, episode of Alpha if you want to uh, before you recommend it to someone else. It's a great, great program. So 20 minutes of the video and then after that we have about 40 minutes of uh, discussing together uh, all sorts of questions right from the beginner beginner questions to more in-depth questions. No question is out of the realm of Alpha. So uh, I hope that you'll help us uh, make Alpha a wonderful, wonderful program starting January 31st. Thanks so much. Our thanks to Colonel Rowe for his message this morning. And now as we go out into the world, as people of prayer, let me leave you with this verse of scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. May God bless you this week. Crushed beneath his feet for the conqueror.